Hi, I'm Ashley again. Welcome back to our videos. I am joined here today by Dr. Jeffrey Walker. He is the chair of our UT Department of Rhetoric and Writing. We're very lucky to have him. And Dr. Walker is going to talk with you a little bit about rhetorical appeals. Um, so I'll turn it over to him. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm going to talk briefly about uh, ethos, logos, and pathos, which classically considered are the three main kinds of proof in rhetoric. One thing that needs to be uh, recognized is that the, the word proof, when we talk about rhetor rhetorical proofs, actually translates the Greek word pistis, or plural pistes, which really means a, a source of faith or a source of trust or a guarantee. So when we talk about rhetorical proofs, we're not talking about things like mathematical proofs or scientific proofs, but, but proofs or persuaders that make an audience more inclined to believe or do something. Let me look at the next. So again, the, the three main proofs or pistes are ethos, the moral character or the apparent moral character of the speaker, logos, the stated reasons in the speech or the piece of writing for believing a claim, and finally pathos, the emotion or mood of the audience. Uh, again, it's important to remember that these pistes or proofs are associated with the three main parts of the rhetorical situation. So if, again, for example, ethos derives from the speaker, logos derives from the speech or what the speaker says, and pathos derives from the audience. So let's talk about logos first. Logos is the part of the rhetorical appeals that tends to be talked about the most. There's a lot that can be said. I'm going to keep it real brief. I, again, the word logos uh, it comes from a Greek word that means word, statement, or reason, or a speech. Um, in the appeal to logos, a stated reason is given for a claim. So what does that mean? Here's an example. Somebody makes the claim that funding for the SPURS program should be increased. Somebody who isn't yet persuaded that that's a good idea says, why? And so the speaker offers a reason. Because that would be, enable the program to serve more students. So that's an appeal to Logos, uh, the giving of a reason. Now, again, one thing that's important to note is that stated reasons in the Logos appeal depend on or bring in unstated assumptions. So again, if, if we look at the same argument, we've got the claim funding for the SPURS program to be increased. Somebody asks why. Uh, the reason is because that would enable the program to serve more students. And so that, that reason brings with it certain assumptions. Uh, one, for example, is that increasing funding for the program would in fact increase the number of students that could be in the program or would in fact increase the, ser the student services of the program. Uh, why wouldn't it perhaps just be used to increase administrator salaries or to buy office furniture or other things? So there's an assumption being made right there that isn't stated and may have to be defended. Another assumption that, that uh, this appeal to Logos is making is that increasing uh, the service to, to more students would in fact be a good thing. That isn't overtly said, but it's assumed that that's true. So. The giving of reasons always depends or brings along with it uh, sets of unstated assumptions. That's important because the questioning of reasons and assumptions on one hand makes us better critical readers, better critical listeners, but also if we are writers or the makers of arguments, it helps us to make better arguments. So I, I'm not going to run through all of this here, but basically this this example on the screen uh, illustrates an exchange in which reasons and assumptions are questioned and in response to those questions, further reasons are given. Those raise more questions, further reasons are given, and the process can, can continue until virtually all of the possible uh, arguments or reasons that could be given have been played out. And now this, the issue is better understood than it was at the beginning. 
I also want to note that there are different kinds of reasons that can be given in a logos appeal. One kind that we could call logical rationales. For example, if the Spurs program is a good thing, then more of it would be better. Another kind of a reason that can be given is examples. Look at how student X, John over here, was helped by this program. That's the kind of effect that it has. Another kind of reason that can be given is what we might call factual evidence or data. For example, statistics show that this program uh, increases student success in college by 35% or some, some number. And a fourth kind of reason that can be given uh, as, as a kind of proof or pistis is testimony from reliable sources. So educational experts agree that these kinds of programs are very successful and students in our program generally feel that it has helped them a lot. So those are four main types of reasons that can be given. Let me turn now a little more briefly to the ethos appeal. Ethos, again, is the apparent character of the speaker, that is the character of the speaker as viewed by the audience. In the appeal to ethos, the trustworthiness of the speaker's character or apparent character stands as a reason for, the, for trusting what the speaker says uh, and trusting the speaker's intentions. So an example of the uh, ethos appeal might be, funding for Spurs should be increased. Believe me, I'm an expert on these things. I mean, that may not be a very good ethos appeal, but it's, a, it's an ethos appeal. Now, in the ethos appeal, there are various elements that contribute to a trustworthy ethos, or, or the absence of them contributes to an untrustworthy ethos. These include things like knowledge and, or expertise on the subject being discussed, the appearance of fair-mindedness, intelligence, and good intentions, that is, the speaker has the audience's best interest really at heart, in general, good moral character as revealed in the expressed attitudes of the speaker. And finally, the speaker's general reputation. If the speaker is well known to be a trustworthy person, that helps. If the speaker is well known to be a, a problematic person, that doesn't help. So those are the main components of ethos appeal. If the speaker has a bad ethos, that is, if the speaker seems untrustworthy to the audience, then his or her arguments will be distrusted no matter how logical they seem. And that's an important point to remember. Finally, let me talk about pathos uh, even more briefly. Pathos, again, uh, is a Greek word that means originally passion or emotion or feeling. In the appeal to pathos, the emotion or mood of the audience stands as a reason for believing what the speaker says or doing what the speaker advocates. That is, emotion is a motivator. So it, emotion motivates the audience to believe or to do. Uh, they, they want to believe what's being said, they want to do what they're being asked to do, if they have the right pathos. Now, pathos can be aroused or changed by the speaker. For example, the speaker may present images or ideas that connect with the audience's deep values and feelings for example. Uh, and look at this suffering child, and maybe the picture of a child is shown, or a video, or some image. Don't you want to do something about it? That's a pathos appeal. Uh, or, using an idea rather than an image, we should all oppose this policy because it threatens our freedom. Freedom being a value-laden and emotional term for many people. Or in, in a case of trying to change the audience's pathos, you shouldn't be angry about what he did. It wasn't intentional. So in these ways and others, speakers can arouse or try to change the pathos of the audience. Finally, we should note that ethos, logos, and pathos all work together. The three proofs or the three pistes should be thought of as simultaneous dimensions of persuasion that are always present. Although admittedly one or another may be more predominant at a given point, they all are, have, 
they all are present or have to be present. So ethos makes the speaker seem trustworthy. Logos makes the speaker seem reasonable or makes the speaker's claim seem reasonable. And pathos makes the audience care. Now, any of, if any of these things is missing, the argument is likely to fail. On the other hand, if they all are present, the argument is likely to be strong. It, it may not persuade fully, but it's going to be stronger. So again, we should think of ethos, logos, and pathos as simultaneous dimensions of persuasion that all work together. And that concludes this little talk. Thank you.